What's going on guys? Welcome to the very first episode of The Games Adjuster. My name is Ethan Rodriguez and today we are talking about big Kickstarter game, Company of Heroes. So, a little backstory before we get into the overview. I backed this Kickstarter uh, a couple years ago when it was first announced. I had not really gotten into too many Kickstarters before this. My first Kickstarter, just like a month before, was Smartphone Inc. And so I wasn't sure what to expect. It's been about 22 months and since uh, the game was first kickstarted and then delivered. Just got it about last week, so I'm in the Texas area. So it was about week of, uh, or April 2nd, somewhere around there. So, got a chance to play it a few times. Want to give you my thoughts on it. So let me first go to the table. I'll show you some things about it. And we'll come back here and we'll talk about what my thoughts were, what I liked, what I didn't like. And if you should hop on the 1.5 campaign when that comes out, or if you should hunt down a copy for those that are selling it. So here we go. Okay, so here we have set up a small map game of Company of Heroes by Bad Crow Games. And so I have set this up here. It's a little tight of a picture, so bear with me as I explain just a basic overview of the game. And after that, I'll give you my final thoughts. So here again, we have a small map set up. This one is the DuPont's small map. The board comes with these different size panels or they're all the same size, but multiple panels with some of these icons printed on them. Uh, for this small map, you will use the flags. If you have the terrain pack, these are included in that. They're pretty neat, little stands. And then you'll put out some of these resource tokens to represent new places that resources will be gathered from. And you'll ignore the pre-printed ones on the board. Those will not count for this particular game. Now the medium maps and the large maps, I believe most of them are the pre-printed ones that you'll be using, but just a heads up there. I've also accelerated the game a little bit. Normally you would be starting at a specific spawn point. So here team one starts way back here where my finger is here. And team two starts a little bit off the, the camera shot but I've accelerated the game just for some example purposes. So, game of Company of Heroes is played over three main phases and that constitutes one round of the game. And the game will continue round by round until the end game conditions are met. For this particular scenario, it would be a 10 point victory condition to win the game. And you'll keep track of those points using this here uh, board. It tracks your incomes that you'll gather at the end of each supply phase and then your stockpiles which are resources you've accrued throughout the game. And so small map, this particular scenario is 10 points you win. The base game scenario has a medium, short, and long game and variable victory point conditions. And of course, it's your game, you can do what you want and you can make it shorter or longer if you want to. So let's just talk through how to play the game and I'll break down these phases one by one and give you a basic understanding of the game also go over some of the advanced variant rules that are in the game and here we go so to begin the game you will first start with the maneuver phase so in the maneuver phase of every round you'll determine turn order which is the player with the least amount of victory points now if there's a tie such as the beginning of the game you're going to roll three of these damage slash upgrade dice and these dice have two black colored sides two green colored sides and two red colored sides. So you'll roll three dice if there's a tie. Whoever has uh, the most green die will get to choose if they wanna go first or second, which is your choice because there's tactical advantages to both. Um, now, actually before you go to the dice tiebreaker, you would check your incomes. So if there was a tie on the actual stockpile victory points, you would then check who has the greater income on the stockpile up here, then the fuel, then the munitions, and then your manpower. And so whoever had the least would get to go first because they're losing and get that tactical advantage of choosing first or second. So uh, for this example, let's just pretend that the US forces are going to be the first player and they're going to go ahead and take the first turn. And in this scenario, I've got the Russian forces over here, the US forces over here. I'll also mention briefly, which we'll get to more later, um, these particular factions may not be best for those a uh, color challenge, so I apologize for that. Also, the dice might be hard to tell for you since there are green, red, and black, uh, so I apologize for that. Now, moving on. 
So in the beginning of every maneuver phase, you'll determine turn order, turn order, and then you'll spend three command points per player rotating between teams until you spend nine total command point cubes. So these command points are going to be assigned to each player, and they're going to spend three on their turn. And each maneuver phase consists of three different turns, okay? And so maneuvering in the game is pretty easy. Most units are just going to move one space at a time. So here we've got, for this particular guy, game, I've got a group of riflemen, I've got a mortar team, and I've got one Willie's Jeep, which is right here. And we'll check that out real quick. And so on the Americans' turns, if I wanted to just move uh, my rifleman squad here, I could spin the cube, move them forward. Let's spin another cube and move them forward. That's two of my three moves this turn. And I could also spin one over here and move this mortar team. Boom. Now, once I've spent those cubes, it would be the Russian player's turn. So let's just pretend that they would like to move their vehicle here, these three spaces, one, two, three, and then they're done. And then it would go back to the Americans. And so each unit can only move a total of three times in a single round. Okay, so keep that in mind. I've spent these units twice already. I've moved this unit once. If I wanted to, I could move them again. I could move them again in the next turn, but I could not move them more than three total times. The exception to that would be certain vehicles which have speed as indicated by this die here. So this Willys Jeep would actually start with this die with it. And if I wanted to for a free move, not counting one of my cubes, I could spin that by turning it to the uh, no speed or, or it's called uh, spent speed side. And then I would get a free move with that. Same is true with this particular vehicle on these command uh, board cards or these building boards, it will tell you what abilities you might have. And there's some upgrade opportunities for this particular mortar team to also get that same speed die. So you have to be careful or pay attention to that. So um, we would go back and forth moving. Let's pretend we've done all the moves we're going to do. And then we would get into the damage phase. And this is really uh, probably the part of the game I think takes the longest, but it's pretty intuitive and it's, and it's really neat. So let's say this team was right there. So every unit, going back to this building board, has a range, okay? So the rifleman's range is two, the mortar team can shoot up to four away, they cannot shoot in a space adjacent to themselves uh, because it's a mortar, and then the Willy's Jeep has got a range of two. Now, although these ranges might vary, and as you get into some of these bigger units, they've got three range, two range, two range, the sight, of every unit is by default only two spaces. So going back to the mortar team, although they can shoot someone who's four spaces away, their sight is only two. So in order to be able to hit someone four spaces away, they would need to have a spotter. And for the purposes of spotting, all of your units can spot for any other unit. So let's pretend we've got this example right here. And so I'm going to be assigning damage. Now when you assign damage, you're looking at the attack that each of your units can do. So this rifleman squad right here can do one anti-infantry attack. And I can do that to any unit that's in my range of two that I can see, which is again two. So in this example, I could see this unit here for the Russians, the conscripts. So I will assign one anti-infantry damage to them. And then I'll go to my next unit, the Willie's Jeep can do one infantry, infantry damage as well, and they can also hit from two away and they can see that unit as well. So we'll pile it on to these conscripts. And then the mortar team would actually, in the advanced rules, start out as, uh, this is no fire status. And so to deploy, they would need to spend one of their movement command cubes to go into deployed status, and then they would be eligible to be shooting a target. So here in this example, they could also shoot this unit because either the rifleman or the Jeep can spot for them because they are within two and this unit is within four total spaces of the mortar squad. So they deal one high explosive damage. So on that same damage die, we'll find that particular side 
and we'll place it down. And so now this unit has to deal with all of these damages here. And simultaneous fire would come back to my forces by the opposing units. So they would check who they can see and they would check their card here and assign damage appropriately, very similar to the way that I just did. And of course, every unit does different kinds of damage. Some units like these more advanced ones have a turret that will assign two armor piercing damage and uh, one in tech infantry damage in their front facing area. And so you'll need to look at what options you might have as you upgrade and have those options available. Uh, but just to finish out this example, we'll assume that the Russians didn't see anybody and, and we're the only ones who can make an attack. So in the advanced game, anytime you would assign this high explosive damage, you'll need to roll it first. And so you'll roll the die. If it's a black side that comes up, which again is one out of three chance, you will place the die down, you get one high explosive damage. If it is a green side, such as this one or this one, you actually get to count that as two high explosive damage. And if it was a red die, you would miss altogether. And then this damage does not get assigned to this unit. In the base game, it just automatically counts before defense rolls. So let's get into the defense rolls here for each unit. As you'll see on this defense matrix, every unit has certain defense that they'll have against certain damage types. So most units will have no defense against fire, only the red units or the heavy armored units will, are not affected by fire. The heavy armor units are not affected by anti-infantry either. Uh, however, the green infantry units, and all of them are indicated here on this side of the building board, they will only roll defense for any armor piercing damage. So going down to this example here, we've got two infantry damage, one high explosive damage. Based on this defense matrix, matrix, this unit would not have any defense. And so therefore they would need to deal with three hits. And so these three hits would take out all three of these units and this unit would be destroyed. All right. Now, if let's say only two units had been taken, we would pop off two units. We would leave that tray there with the one unit remaining and that would be in the end of those casualties. If they did have a defense roll, well, let's pretend that we had somehow done armor piercing damage along with these two infantry. They would still need to take two infantry hits, so these would be gone. But they would get to roll this armor piercing damage. And when you roll for defense, you have a two out of three chance of succeeding. Black or green, and you are fine. The damage is canceled, nothing else happens. However, if it's red, the armor, the damage goes through, just like in the last example, and that last unit would also be destroyed. Okay, um, now there are also printed on the board, and you'll notice here we've got these lovely buildings, opportunities for cover. So on the board, it's kind of hard to see here, but you can see some of these yellow lines. And so these represent light cover that is pre-printed on the board and will give you the opportunity to have additional an additional die to roll and if you're ever in heavy cover which is identified by these buildings and you don't have to have these upgraded buildings although they are lovely you could just have the green outlined hexes on the board that would give you two extra die so if the same damage had been done to a unit in heavy or light cover they would have gotten an additional roll to potentially avoid some of the damage that was being distributed so after you assign damage you can uh, defend for them. You'll apply the results at the same time. And after everyone's finished, you will remove any destroyed units and collect experience and victory points. So one of the main ways to get victory points is by destroying other units. In the base game, you get one point for each unit you destroy. You also get experience, which will track with these white cubes for each unit you destroy, as well as the first time that a unit is damaged in the round. So in this example, if this was the only unit I damaged, I'd get one cube for damaging them. If I destroyed the entire unit, this would go back to the player, and I would get another cube of experience, and I would track that on my board. And that takes us to the supply phase. So in the supply phase, if you have a unit that is an infantry unit or a unit that has this capture symbol, then in the space where one of these 
a resource post is present, then you can capture that area and put one of your flags on it. So again, we've got the upgraded components. We can take one of these here stands, put the flags on it. We'll go blue for America. And then there we go. Now we control that area. And if the opponent had some that they controlled as well, they would do the same thing with their flags. We've got these red ones set aside for the Russians, but it doesn't matter which one you use. Red or blue is fine. And then you would immediately then update your stockpiles. So if I had zero victory points, which in this particular game I would start with, and I had captured this one here, I would go up one, and now I will be collecting one victory point per round until that is taken over by an opponent. Okay, so you'll collect your capture your flags, you'll adjust your income, you will collect resources according to your income levels, and then you'll spend resources. So, this is probably where you're going to see the most uh, agonizing choices in the game. And so, when you are buying units, you've got the units that you start with on your first building board. And so, the, for the Americans, we've got Rifleman, Mortar Team, and Willie's Jeep. But, you can bring out all kinds of units. We've got this here, Sherman Tank for the Americans. There we go. We've got, uh, let's see, the M10. And so if you want to bring out some of these larger units and more powerful units, you'll need to first unlock these building boards. This particular company command post, the second building for the Americans, would cost one manpower and three fuel. So we would go to our board here. We would spend one manpower. And let's assume we had three fuel, three fuel. And now we would unlock the ability to choose any of these units to then spawn. And so on this particular board, we've got a 50 cal machine gun team, an anti-tank gun, an M8 Greyhound. On our final board, if we unlock that, we've also got a major uh, M4A3 Sherman, the Wolverine. And so you'll have all kinds of units available to you as you unlock those, but you will, of course, have to spend those resources to first get access to them. And then you won't have sometimes a situation where you spend them and you won't have the ability to get them right now. So it's a, an investment for the long term. You'll also be able to spend these experience points and your munitions, which is the red resource, to upgrade some of your units. So going back to an example here with our starting team, if I were to spend two experience points, I could give my rifle unit either an extra anti-infantry damage that would be assigned every time, and I'll track that there, or an armor piercing damage. And in the game, as part of some of their stretch goals, it did give us some bazooka miniatures. So these do not have their own squad, but they can be slotted in to your rifle min squad to give them a different look or, or kind of represent that they've got this additional power. Uh, you'll track it with this as the technical way to do it. But this is a fun way to show that this rifle unit is not your ordinary group of guys. So um, you can also spend munitions to do accomplish the same thing. Uh, although munitions, I will say, is hard to come by in this particular example because there's only one spot. But in other maps, there might be more opportunity. Uh, so if you wanted to upgrade some of the units you have, you could do that. Upgrading a unit, I will mention, does not affect all the units. So in this example, this rifleman squad would be upgraded, but if I had a separate squad over here that was also riflemen, I would need to pay again to upgrade them. And so, um, let's talk a little bit more about some of these advanced rules. So in the advanced game, I mentioned that these this mortar team would not actually be deployed until you used the command cube to deploy them. So the way we're tracking that is with this status die, and this has got all kinds of things. So each of these die has a ton of symbols on them that represent what they do. So we've talked about the white die. It basically has anti-infantry damage, armor piercing, high explosive, flame, speed, and spent speed. We've got these blue die here, which will give you defense upgrades, smoke upgrades, will, which will give you an ability to basically not be seen unless you're adjacent to them. Increased sight, so instead of your default range of two, you now have a three sight. Doesn't increase your range to hit, but it does increase your ability to see your opponent and possibly spot for other people. 
You've also got this one here, which is both sight and range as an increase. You've got camouflage, which you'll see in some of the Russian snipers, uh, which is another way to not be seen by opponents. You've got the veteran ability uh, here in this red status die. You've got the pinned icon, which can be used by machine gun teams to pin down their opponents and make it such that they can't attack you or move. They would need to retreat to uh, get away from that uh, pin status. You've got slow, where in the advanced game, again, some of the larger units aren't able to move and shoot uh, at all angles. They would have to adhere to their firing arc and they would need to move and then move a tick one way or the other when they move. And if they've got the slow die, instead of being able to move and tick left or right and then move again, it would need to spin the cube just to tick and then spin another cube to move. And that's what the slow does. And if you have a double slow, some of the very large units, they can only move one hex per round, I believe. So very devastating power as far as combat goes, but not very good to move around. And then lastly, we've got these elite die. Now these are not in the base game like these other ones are. Uh, these do come in one of the expansions, but they will help to track some of the other abilities you'll get where you get extra range. Um, you've got the increased size of your infantry units. So instead of starting with three uh, men, you will have maybe four. Uh, so that's it for that. Uh, you've got all kinds of symbols here on the back of the book. There's a little more nuance that I'm not going to get into entirely. This is not by any means a how to play video. This is just giving you the bare essentials to get started and just give you an idea of how it feels. So let me go back up top. I'll cover anything else I may have missed um, in this brief overview with you there and I'll give you my final thoughts. Here we go. Okay, so that was a brief overview of Company of Heroes. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the overview itself, that was not by any means a full and comprehensive explanation of every rule that there is. There's a little more nuance to it than, I sh than what I showed in the explanation. Um, it's a big game as far as table presence and things to consider, but the actual gameplay mechanics are pretty easy. And so let's go ahead and get into my thoughts on the game. We'll start with the theme. The theme is excellent. Everything that you do in the game feels thematic. The way that, in the advanced rules anyways, the tanks that are larger move a little slower. Makes sense. How you capture your, your resource post. The infantry units can capture. Certain units have the ability to upgrade and then be able to capture. And so, if you're a World War II buff or fan, even though there's actually technically three allies and one axis in the box, uh, there's an expansion that allows you to get the Oberkommando West team, which is just an alternative German faction. So you'll get two axis and three allies. Uh, but even without that, it doesn't play as a good guys, bad guys, depending on how you look at history kind of game. It's You can be whatever faction you want to be. If you want to play British versus Americans, you can do that, and that's really cool. Uh, that breaks the World War II theme a little bit, uh, but the gameplay itself feels thematic. And so production-wise, it's off the charts, guys. I mean, I'm talking amazing miniatures. I am not a miniatures expert, but these miniatures have some heft to them. I'll show you, um, you know, this guy here. It feels heavy. It comes in these fantastic inserts. So in this insert, you've got, this is the American one, all the, the section for your units. On the backs of these units, it gives you a name. This is the Sherman. Uh, you've got spaces for your infantry here. Each faction comes with their own tray. Um, you've got those nice custom dice. They roll real nice. They've got curved edges. The resources that you use throughout the game, and when I say resources, I mean your dice, your damage cubes, your tracking cubes. They all come in this nice, large insert here, and I'll grab it for you. Sorry, I'm professional. But uh, you've got this nice tray that everything fits into. You can sit it right there on the side of the table when you're playing, and you'll have everything at your fingertips as far as what you need. If you buy the terrain pack, and, and all those things I've showed you so far, base game. Now, if you go all in Kickstarter, 
and you buy the terrain pack, you've got these great building miniatures. You've got in the terrain pack, one of the miniatures, you've got these um, sandbags, sorry, sandbags, tank traps, razor wire. Um, in the base game, you've got mortar guns, little machine guns that you'll slot into the infantry um, trays. You've got um, anti-tank guns. You've got the trays themselves are really neat. They anti-infantry trays hold five total units or guns. They can hold the dice too that you upgrade them with. So it's easy to track what units have what upgrades. There's not as much as there is on the board as far as minis and dice. It's easy to track together because you can slide the tray along together. Uh, same thing with the vehicles. Now there's only six vehicle trays in the base game. I think you might be able to add more. I didn't really look into that. So uh, apologies, I, I could be wrong. I wish there was a little more of those. Um, there are six infantry trays for each faction, which is plenty, but there's only six total vehicle trays. And it would have been nice to be able to have that same uh, convenience of moving your vehicles with the dice and the upgrades and everything like that. Uh, there are also these building die. I didn't show them. They're just gray and gray die white pips. You can use that to track the damage to your vehicles instead of the orange damage cubes that you would use. You didn't see those in the interview, or I'm sorry, the overview, uh, but you saw maybe on the side. So the infantry units, you'll just pop off for each casualty you take. And then the vehicles and the tanks and uh, emplacements, things like that, you'll track that damage with the orange cubes or the building dice or the gray dice. So up to you, but all the components are great. Uh, the Terrain Pack 2 has this nice cathedral. It's got British emplacements. The British faction has a lot of anti-tank, uh, regular machine gun, just capturing point kind of emplacements that they can use. And they all have the 3D models for those that are really awesome. The base game has the cardboard one, so you don't need it. Everything functions without those upgrades, but if you go all in like I did, and you are a fan of those items, you're really gonna feel like you got your money's worth. And it was well worth the wait because the production is outstanding. So uh, let's talk about rules. For the most part, I think the rules are pretty well done. Um, there is not too much more on the advanced side when compared to the basic game. Uh, me, I'm, I'd like to think a pretty seasoned gamer. Now this is the first video I'm doing, so I'm hoping to do more of these for you guys, but as it comes to games, I generally am the rules guy, and I did not feel, to me, that playing the game was that rules heavy. Once you learn the game and you've gone through a few turns, it's pretty intuitive as to what's next. Okay, we move, we've gotten to position to fire, we're going to fire now, tanks have certain firing arcs, if it's got a turret that goes 360, you'll have some additional options. If it's a fixed gun, like a machine gun or a mortar, well not a mortar, mortar can shoot 362, but a fixed gun, if it's a anti-tank gun, it's got a certain firing arc and you have to stay within that. And if you need to adjust that, didn't show this in the overview, but you'll need to pack up, adjust, and then redeploy, which is thematic, going back to that. So the rules aren't that much. I would have liked, on the back of these building boards is a small breakdown of the phases as well as the defense matrix. Now the defense matrix is not on the back of the rule book. A breakdown of the phases is along with all the symbology. That's nice. I would have loved individual cards to show everybody what those things were so you didn't have to pass the rule book around. Now I get maybe why they don't do that. The game is a bit of a table hog. Just the one panel fills up a pretty good size chunk of my table. Uh, if I play a medium or a large game, which is two or three panels respectively, it's going to be even larger. Then you've got the tray of resources, you've got the tray of minis. I get why maybe if we could minimize the footprint by not having an additional rules aid or small guide next to you, that might be efficient. So it's not that hard. It's just when you're teaching new players and if you're learning the game, even if you're not a rookie player or anything like that, it's nice to have that rules reference available to you so you don't have to reach across the table. So minor complaints, 
Otherwise, the rules are pretty easy. The forums are got a few questions that haven't come up yet if you go to BGG, uh, but they're well answered. And Bad Crow has been great so far just responding to things. So well done for that. Uh, gameplay is great. I mean, it's quick as far as the playing of it each turn. Uh, the length really comes into those decisions that you make. So when you're assigning damage, who do I target? Do I focus fire? Do I spread it out? Do I have a guy to spot for this particular unit? Uh, you know, what are they doing when I'm buying resources and upgrades? If they bought a bunch of tanks, I need to make a tactical decision to invest in anti-tank units so that I can destroy them. I could have a bunch of infantry and that's really cool, but if they don't do any damage to those tanks, then I'm gonna be in trouble and I'm, I'm gonna waste all my resources on buying units that are gonna die pretty soon. So you need to constantly play that, that chess game of what are they doing, how can I counteract them, but also accomplish what I need to do. I need to capture these resource points so that I can buy more units. I need to make sure that I'm putting pressure on them so they can't just keep racking up these victory points with the stockpiles. So keeping that in mind and also the options you get to choose between the upgrades and balancing, do I buy the building boards? Do I maybe just upgrade the units I've already got? Uh, I didn't show this as well, but in the advanced game, there's these commander cards. And these commander cards, I'll, I'll grab a couple here for you. Um, there's some for each faction. These are the Russian ones. They change the way that your faction units operate. So the Russians have one that I played with recently where your conscripts, your basic infantry unit, can reinforce by paying two munitions. And so... That's a really neat ability, whereas the normal conscripts just start with three units and infantry help that you start with is identified by a number in the green heart on your building board. But that commander card allowed me to reinforce them a little more and more quickly. And so I had four units and now they could take a little more, a little more hits. Um, there's tons of them. I mean, there's an expansion entirely devoted to elite commanders wherein you have special tanks and special heavy armored units that you can only use with these commanders and they basically call them in for you and you know do some devastating effects i think there's one even that is universally used for all factions so that's neat uh, but most factions have five in the base game i think each and then you've got the elite commanders if you buy that expansion which has several more um, and so gameplay is really awesome it's really neat to make those decisions and have that not light i mean it's not a light war game but it's a i'd say medium weight war game that looks great feels uh tactical and strategic with the decisions you're making because they are long-term ramifications on those decisions you made on the first and second round on what to invest in but also is easy to get into and the accessibility is great because the rules aren't that long uh, there's not a ton of well, line of sight this and you know am i dealing with weather no, there's none of that so it's accessible enough that even if you're not a war gamer you can get into it and if you are a war gamer you're going to appreciate that the theme is brought out in such beautiful miniatures and the gameplay still feels rewarding that, that if you are a quote-unquote better player you are probably going to do well so Overall, gameplay is fast or great. I don't want to ramble too much. Um, the time is a little long to set up, and that's my biggest complaint. And that might be more a Kickstarter bloat issue, and not that I feel like it's unnecessary. I love the stuff, but you've got a huge base game box. You've got to pull out the trays. You've got to set up the board, and the boards are like six full panels, and just for one. And you've got to check the mission book. You know how do I set this up? Do I need to overlap it? Aren't there any other items that I need to put on it, such as resource tokens? Um, if you've got the terrain pack, you're of course wanting to use the buildings, why wouldn't you? So you're pulling those out, um, you're assembling your units, you are in the assigned damage phase, there's a lot of die placement, and then in the resolution of the assigned damage phase when you're rolling things, you've got to consider, do I have cover? Do I have heavy cover? Um, can they even see me? So sometimes especially early in your gaming uh, career with this game it's gonna feel a little slow but that will go away 
I played the first time we played it was a little slow. Probably took about two and a half hours between setup and play time for just two players on a small map. Uh, the next time, two days later, we played a medium map, me and my wife, and we got it done in about two hours too. Now that was a larger map, a higher victory point total. We went from 10 points in the same DuPont's map to the Trois-Ponts map and went from 10 points to 13 points as far as victory and it played about the same time. So that's good. Uh, as you get better and more proficient with the game, it's gonna run a little smoother and as you start to recognize what you can do and what options you have available, you, you'll be making snappier decisions because you'll kind of learn your factions and you already have a game plan as to what you need to do going in. So I would say on the whole, it's about average, can run all along, set up a little bit of a, a lot to do, uh, you know, especially if you have everything, but overall the gameplay doesn't feel uh, super slow. It feels like you're moving at a good pace, the better you get. And so uh, lastly, variety. The variety is amazing if you have the Kickstarter and even if you went all in on Kickstarter, I should say. And even if you didn't, uh, it's still a ton of stuff. I mean, just playing the mission booklet, uh, don't have it readily available, but there's a ton of them. There's the small maps, there's the medium maps, there's the large maps. Uh, within just the same map, you've got different setups and rules that you can implement. You know, as, uh, you can set these base tokens out basically and play capture the flag. You can change the victory point condition, and that kind of changes your decisions. In a longer game, you might invest in some of those large, heavy vehicles and really do some damage where you can start slow and then come back because you've built for the long term. Whereas in a shorter game, that may change what you invest in. You may not even need your second or third board. The first game we played, we didn't even unlock those because it was such a small map that it was better to have infantry units coming in and trying to conquer these territories and prevent your opponent from conquering them, uh, as opposed to going without the units, getting wiped off the board and hoping to bring out this one tank that could be wiped out theoretically in one blow. So um, you have to make those decisions and that increases variety in and of itself. And then when you add in all of the Kickstarter stuff, you've got the elite commanders I talked about earlier. Uh, let me show you some of it here. We've got these small units here. This is a, Eastern Reinforcements expansion pack for the Russians. It adds uh, sniper models, which are just for fun, really, and then you can have the snipers in the base game. Uh, but it also adds the uh, special tanks. We've got Stug Assault pack, which added the elite dice and then more tanks. We've got the Pathfinders pack, which adds additional models for the US infantry and then some more commander cards and of course an elephant tank. And so there's a ton of variety in which units you use, how you choose to deploy them, how does the map look, um, which faction you use, even you know beyond just the units in the single faction, which faction do you use? Do you throw in some of those elite commanders? Which commander card do you choose? So variety, base game is already off the charts. And then when you throw in Kickstarter, I mean, there's probably no way I'm ever going to play with all of it, to be honest with you. But it's fun to have. And if you're a completionist like me, then you want it. So overall, I, I know there's not a ton of reviews on this. And I know that uh, my this is my first one. So I apologize if it's a little ranty or rambly. And, um, you know, the quality, I'll, I'll work on that. But overall, I think Bad Crow Games did a great job and it was well worth the wait. If you are interested in this at all, and I've never played the video game by the way, so I have no prior um, favoritism or, or interest in the game before this board game port, and I think it does a fantastic job. And I'm, I'm sure if I played the video game, I would recognize a lot of the similarities. So you can tell me in the comments if that's right or wrong, how it feels in comparison, but I think overall the game is great. I would be on a nine out of 10 on the uh, scale for me. It is very strong. There's a few minor things as far as just the time and the rules availability, but uh, that might even go up. You know, as I get better at it, I might not see that as a something that's going to downgrade the rating. It may just be something I need to get used to. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, if I mess something up in the rules, let me know in the comments. Um, 
tell me what you think of the game, if you've got it, or if, what region in the uh, states or the world you're in, if you if you got it yet, and share that with the community, and so that way they know when to expect their goodies. And yeah, if you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Otherwise, I've been Ethan Rodriguez with the Games Adjuster, and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.